Hi there, dance studio owners, and welcome to a very special four-part series of the Transform My Dance Studio podcast. Throughout the month of March, we are celebrating by bringing you something extra special on the podcast. In fact, this is the first time ever that we have shared with you a sneak peek into our exclusive dance studio owners' inner circle virtual retreats. That's right. Over the next four weeks, you'll have your own front row ticket into our inner circle retreats, where we are sharing with you some of the best moments from our world-class speakers. If you love this exclusive recording, make sure to join our waitlist at dsoa.com slash inner circle. Now, let's welcome this week's special guest. I'm excited because uh, we have a repeat offender joining us right now in the inner circle, our highest rated speaker of 2020 and you all kept saying bring them back bring them back bring them back we want to hear more and so he is joining us again you guys know him his name is Dave Crenshaw he's a highly sought after author speaker and a business coach he's appeared in Time Magazine USA Today Fast Company the BBC News and has published five books in eight languages The most popular one is The Myth of Multitasking, and uh, he's just released a new edition of that, and uh, that is his topic for today. We Guys, we are talking about productivity and the myth of multitasking to round out our time together here inside of the Inner Circle. Dave, welcome back, my friend. It's so nice to have you with us. Hey, thank you, Clint. It's so glad glad to be, I'm so glad to be here. This is my people too. I love working with you because you're entrepreneurs and I have coached so many uh, uh, dance studio owners. And uh, plus, we just had a lot of fun. Just by raise of hands, if you can find that uh, reaction button, how many of you saw me last year at Clint's event in Las Vegas? So we have quite a few, lots of yeses, me, some hands raised as well. Yeah. Okay, we, great. Yeah, but we've got a lot of new, we got a lot of new people, Dave. So a lot of people that haven't seen you. Okay, wonderful. Well, so uh, last time I spoke, uh, for those of you who did see it, I spoke about uh, the focus business and about the mistakes that entrepreneurs make uh, in terms of being scattered and chaotic in their business. Today, I want to talk to you about the personal level of being more focused, how you as individuals, how your employees as individuals can get more time. Uh, For those of you who do not uh, know me or haven't seen me before, uh, I'm reaching you from Salt Lake City. This is not a a Zoom background. This is my real office in Salt Lake City. Uh, and uh, And as I mentioned before, I have three children and one wife, just in case you were curious about that, uh, me being from Utah. Uh, And some of the accolades that I've received, I've been in uh, Time Fast Company, and that was actually just re-upped again uh, with my book, uh, The Myth of Multitasking, which the second edition comes out uh, next week. Actually, it's out on Kindle and audiobook. Uh, and, uh, And I have courses on LinkedIn Learning, the most popular of which is Time Management Fundamentals. And I'm going to share some principles from that with you here. But I always like to say this because it's the coolest thing that's ever happened to me and probably the coolest thing that will ever happen to me, uh, other than marrying my wife, of course, uh, is that uh, I was mentioned by the Chuck Norris in the official Chuck Norris fact book. And I love that uh, I've seen some uh, some new Chuck Norris facts this year, uh, such as this one, how Chuck Norris was exposed to the coronavirus and now the virus is in quarantine for 14 days. Uh, So in that book, uh, there's a fact, one of his favorite facts is that Chuck Norris can kill two stones with one bird. And uh, in that he cites me and my book, The Myth of Multitasking. We actually got that on the cover of the new edition for this one. So that's just, I'm thrilled with this. Now I had this note here uh, that I wanted to have you guys tell me how you felt because as someone who likes to speak on stage, when you speak virtually sometimes, some of that disconnect happens. But my gosh, I've been uh, seeing you guys comment. I saw what you were doing with Lisa. So I'm just going to say, keep doing what you're doing. It really feeds my energy to be able to see your interactions and your comments. I, I keep that chat window open and your face is open the whole time. I saw you, Brent. I saw you dancing when you did that. That's right. Okay, so... Uh, just by, I always like to start with this. Sometimes when you hear a speaker speak, uh, you, you focus on taking notes and that's fine. Um, but it's not really necessary because everything that I tell you, I, I, I share in my time management course. 
I share in the book the myth of multitasking. So rather than focusing on taking notes during this presentation, I'd encourage you to focus on taking action. That means that there will be moments during this presentation where the light bulb will go on over your head and you say, I need to do that. My studio needs to do that. That is what I would encourage you to write down. So rather than writing down the amazing, wonderful things that I say to you, write down the amazing, wonderful things that you say to you. And you will want to have a piece of paper and a pen handy. We're going to do an exercise together. You will need a piece of paper and pen for that. So I'm going to start with a question that I'd like you to answer in the chat window. And the chat window, this is the question. If you had an extra 40 hours per month, what would you do with the time? Imagine you get done everything that you need to do in your studio and in your life, and you still find yourself magically with the equivalent of a bonus work week. How would you spend that time? Go ahead and put that in the chat window. Spend with family. Mary Lou says, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't read the names. I'm just going to say it as fast as it comes. You guys are great. Work out more, travel, work out, time with your kids, self-improvement, on vacation, exercise more, travel. Boy, wouldn't that be nice once we can really start doing that some more. Uh, local vacations with family. Uh, relax and exercise, downtime, spend time. With, so one of the recurring things I'm seeing from all you is you want to spend more time with family. And as someone who family is incredibly important to me, I think that's, that's wonderful. Did I see anyone put, put sleep on that list? It was going by so fast, but I've heard that one a few times. That would be nice, right? Oh, uh, Donna said volunteer. She's making, she, the rest of us are going, oh yeah, that's what I meant to do. I, I was going to do, you know, I was going to uh, help orphans and stuff like that. That's what I meant to put instead of travel. Okay, great. Now, the reason why I start with this question is because many people, when they hear someone talk about time management, they go, oh, this is, uh, I don't want to hear this. This is just productivity. But instead of focusing on that, I want you to focus on the answer that you put down. Because really, that's what I'm going to show you how to do is get that. Whatever it is that you want with that extra time, I'm going to show you how you can get it in a very real way. So keep that in mind as we're going through this presentation. The second thing that I like to do is I want to kind of get a feel for the audience that I'm speaking to. I find prior to going through my productivity program, there are three groups of people. The first is the focus master. And as you see here, she's got perfect balance and everything is in order. And the focus master through their entire life from the very beginning have never, ever, ever had any issue with time management or organization. Even after they became a dance studio owner, everything still, they were able to keep it all together and they've never had an issue with that their entire life. How many, be honest, how many of you would identify with that? Uh, Jurston says, that's not me. <laughs> uh, anyone I can identify with it? Someone says, wait, I, this exists. Nope. That's a unicorn. I wish. Okay. Now in doing this with audiences around the world, no, oh, there's one, there's Megan. I usually find there's about, oh, one to two out of a hundred, about 2%. So Megan and anyone else who hasn't answered yet, my job is to help you help the rest of these screwed up people around you make your life less miserable. Sound good? Now, the second group is the nomad. Now, the nomad is someone who wants to be a focus master. In fact, they have the, the, the heart and soul of a focus master. That's how they started life. But somewhere along the line, they started to wander out in the wilderness, so to speak. That's why they're a nomad. They lost that that place of, of organization and being on time. And it drives them crazy because they don't know how that happened. Lots of me's coming in on that. There's a third group coming, but the, se the, third, the second group is they are naturally organized. They naturally have good time management. They've just lost touch with it and they can't do it anymore. Okay, great. Now I see a lot of people ra raising their hands or saying yes on that. So my job is to help you show you how you got off track and how to get back to that place of focus master like existence. Would that be valuable to you? And then the third group, well, the third group is what's the opposite of focus? It's chaos. And the chaos master has never been organized or on time. It's not to say that they're not successful. I've worked with many uh, very successful chaos masters. It's just that they've learned how to be successful in spite 
of their natural tendency to create chaos and disorder wherever they go. How many of you would uh, identify with that, the chaos master? Go ahead and type Which one that. are you? <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, now that I have an understanding where you're at, I'd like to talk about where I am. Now, if you heard me speak in, in Las Vegas, you probably already had, kind of have the answer. Um, where I fit as a time management expert is very unusual because typically when you hear a time management expert, that's a guy, that's a gal who has never, ever had issues with time management in their life. And they're coming from a place of a focus master trying to help the rest of us messed up people be organized. But I come from the standpoint of my natural tendency to be a chaos master. Now, this is my office, right? And you'd look at that and you'd say, well, Dave, how does that work? Well, the answer is I've learned how to do it in spite of that natural tendency. In fact, that picture that you see there is not an actual picture of my office, but it's pretty close to what it used to look like. You had to use a shovel to get from the door to the desk. I've been working from home almost the whole time. But that's not just it. I've also had chaos in my career, jumping from career path to career path, from starting as a business coach to being a sales rep to being a high school teacher to right down at the bottom of the screen, that's me trying to be a rock star for a few years. And there was a turning point in my life when I heard my wife say two words to me, and those words were, I'm pregnant. And when I heard those two words, I thought, I can't continue to operate like this. What should I do? So I went out and sought the help of a psychologist who gave me a couple of tests. And in those tests, he said, has anyone ever talked to you about ADHD? I said, well, that's, that's not me. I'm not like that. And he said, no, you are freaking off the charts, ADHD. If there were a fifth standard deviation, you'd be in it. I can say with 99.99% accuracy, you've got it. Now, why do I start with this? This presentation is not about ADHD, but it is about uh, something that we all experience right now, right? Because this is the world that we live in. This, some of you saw this guy on the road. Some of you were this guy on the road. We see it all around, everyone behaving as if they had ADHD. And there's a problem with this. And the problem is that number that you see on the screen. It's 28%. Now, I don't take credit for, for this. Originally, this came from BaseX Research, which was a research firm out of New York. And I cited it back in my book, uh, the, the first edition of The Myth of Multitasking in 2008. And what they found was that the average knowledge worker. So this means someone who's using their brain. They're, we're not talking about like uh, uh, carpenters or, you know, uh, people building things. We're talking about everyone here on this call, someone who uses their knowledge for their career and found that the average knowledge worker loses 28% of their day due to two things, interruptions and the recovery time associated with those interruptions. I'm going to use a different term during this presentation. I'm going to use switches and switching cost, meaning that over one quarter of your day is lost to this one thing. Now, since uh, that I uh, started doing this back in 2008, and I've been doing field research, helping people, consulting people, I believe that in 2021, this number is closer to, to 35%. It's much higher than that. Now, what was the first question that I asked you? What would you do if you had an extra 40 hours per week, where is that going to come from? It's going to come from this number. If we can target this one thing and improve it, we're going to radically improve how much time you have available. But I don't want you to take my word for it. There are plenty of scientific studies that back this up. I cite them in the, with the multitasking. I use the research. However, I have found that me just lathering people up with a bunch of studies and statistics doesn't change behavior. Because my guess is a lot of you who are hearing this have heard before, oh, multitasking isn't a good thing. It's not productive. Okay. But has that changed your behavior? And the answer is probably not. And the re reason why is, is, as I say in the book, I, I paraphrase uh, Mark Twain. Now, Mark Twain is credited. I'll come back to this in just a second. Mark Twain is credited with saying there are lies, damned lies, and statistics. Maybe you've heard that before. 
I say there are lies, damned lies, and multitasking. Multitasking is worse than a lie. It's worse than a damned lie because it is a lie that we all live every single day, don't we? Everyone around you is behaving as if they can be more productive by doing this, but they're not. And we're about to experience why. So you remember I said you need to have a piece of paper and a pen? What I'd like you to do is get that and make your page look exactly like you see on the screen. So just take a a piece of paper. And if there is more than one of you in the room, everyone do this. Like Nate and Sarah, I see you there. Both of you do that. Hi. Take that piece of paper, draw three lines across it so you have four blank rows and then have a pen ready. Okay. Now I'm going to give you instructions about what to do. Do not start until I say go. This is not a think outside the box activity. I'm not trying to trick you or ask you to do anything clever. Just do exactly what I say. Okay. So you see uh, what we're going to do is in the first row, you're going to write out the phrase multitasking is worse than a lie, just as you see it. And then on the second row, you're going to write all the numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, all the way through 27. Why 27? Because that's how many uh, numbers there are in the phrase, multitasking is worse than a lie. And then what I'll do is I'll call out the time every five seconds. And then when you're done, write down your approximate finish time. So don't start until I say go. If you already started, flip over your piece of paper, start again. We got to do this as a timed activity all together. Okay. Get ready, get set, and go. Five seconds. 10 seconds. 15. 20, also type in your time when you're done, approximate time. 25. 30, 35, we'll go 10 more, 40, and 45, and most people are done at this point. Great. Okay, now we got a baseline. You've done this. Pretty easy, pretty simple. Now, we're going to do this again, but we're going to simulate what happens when you think you're multitasking. Because what you're not doing is multitasking. What you're really doing is switch tasking. Meaning every time you try to do multiple things at the same time, like what, like watching, like listening to this, what are you doing? What do you stop that? Like listening to this presentation while you're doing something else, you're not multitasking. You're switching rapidly back and forth, right? And every time you switch, whether it's just mental or there's some physical aspect to it, there's a cost associated with it. There's switching costs. So we're going to simulate that switching cost right now. So now in the third and fourth row, you're again going to do the exact same thing. You're going to write multitasking is worse than lie, one through 27. But for every letter that you write, you're going to write a number. So you'll write M and then one and then U and then two and then L and then three and so on. Got it? So everybody get your pens ready. Get set and go. Five seconds. 10 seconds. 15. 20. 25. 30. By this point, most of you were done last time. 35. And type in your approximate time when you're done. 40. 45. 50. 55. 60, we'll go 10 more, 65, and 70, and if you're not done now, just give up, 
Now, you just experienced the first three switching costs. When you try to switch task, you pay these costs. What's the first and most obvious cost? We can all see it in the chat window. It's time. The amount of time to take that it takes to complete things increases dramatically. Now, some of you, the more critical thinking of you might go, well, Dave, uh, this isn't what uh, life is really like. This, this, this is a, an oversimplification. You're right. It is an oversimplification. This is what your day is like. You'll be uh, sitting at the computer responding to a parent and their concern. They're angry with you. Something happened. They didn't like it. You know how that goes. So you're typing on your email. You're writing out a response. You're crafting a careful response. And then all of a sudden, someone sends you a text message. Now, what do you do? What a lot of people will do is they'll, they'll stop and they'll go, well, that might be important. And they pick up the text message and they look at it and they read it and they ask you a question. And you say, well, the answer is 42. You type it in and you put it back. Now, what do you need to do? All right. You have to rethink where you were in the, in the, in the email. You have to reread what you were saying and you have to start the process all over again. Or if you're a chaos master like me, you may pick up the phone, put it down, realize you have another piece of paper on the desk, pick up that piece of paper, start looking at it, analyze it, pick up the phone, call somebody, say, what's this all about? And three hours later, you still have an unfinished email on your screen. Sound familiar? Whenever you switch between tasks, the amount of time it takes to complete things increases. And by the way, the average person is checking their messages on average about every, uh, well, 10 times an hour. So you imagine how many times that takes place. And every time you switch, you're paying that cost associated with it. All right. What's the second effect? Quality. So hold up your, hold up your piece of paper and show it on the screen. Show that second, second time you did that. Let's take a look at what happened. Yeah, I'm seeing some, you know, numbers crossed out, some things, you know, writing going up and down, that kind of stuff. And how many of you ended up on a number other than 27 by a raise of hands? Right? Yeah. Now, let's talk about this for a second. Tell me if what I'm about to say to you sounds familiar. I'm going to simulate something that sometimes you say in your head or sometimes you've actually said to an employee or someone else. Ready? Didn't we go through this together? Didn't I train you how to do it? I, you know how to do this. We, pr we practiced it together. How did, you, how did you screw up? Sound familiar? Right? Whenever you see highly intelligent people make silly mistakes, and everyone in this conference, you're amazing, you're intelligent, you're entrepreneurs, you're, you're successful, you're so intelligent, and yet... You all made some silly, silly mistakes, right? When you see intelligent, capable people making silly mistakes, that almost always is a symptom of switch tasking, not incompetence. So if you want your people, if you want you to make less mistakes, slow down, do one thing at a time. It takes 2.7 seconds of an interruption to double the likelihood of making a mistake. Now, the third one, maybe isn't so obvious. What's the third effect of doing this? It's stress, right? Think about how you felt between the first and the second time you did this exercise. Can you see that difference? The first time you were writing out the phrase, you were copying out one through 27. It wasn't that big of a deal, right? Well, just copying numbers and letters. The second time, as Annie said, was frustrating. I was calling out the time every five seconds, both the first and the second time. But for some reason, the second time I was calling it out, some of you wanted to throttle me, right? You were like, shut up. I'm, I'm trying to focus here. I'm trying to get this done. You're making it hard for me to focus. Anytime you're trying to switch tasks and someone else interrupts you, whether it's a child, it's an employee, it's whatever it is, it adds to that stress that you feel in your day even in the simplest exercise at all. Darby said, I definitely said, shut up. I'll forgive you for that, Darby. That's okay. So we live in this world that has so many time saving devices. You have, you know, you've got these great uh, tools that Clint's making available to you. You have the top technology available. You have so many stress relieving outlets. 
right? You can relax, you can go to the spa. Well, maybe not as much with COVID, but you can, you know, you can meditate, you can do all these things that never existed in the history of the world. And yet we feel that we have less time and we're more stressed out than we've ever been. And who is to blame for this? Who's to blame? It's Al Gore, right? He invented the internet. It's his fault. No, it's not, it's not Al. It's not Steve. It's not Bill. It's not uh, Elon. It's none of these people. And it's not necessarily even you. It's not technology that's the problem. It's that we have not yet learned how to adapt to the technology. It's the choices that we're making with it that are the problem. Now, I need to respond to a couple of, of concerns, objections, whatever you want to call them, in years of doing this uh, that I've heard. First of all, Dave, what about if I'm, you know, I'm running on the treadmill while I'm watching TV? Isn't that multitasking? Or, you know, all, you know, there are lots of different things that I might be doing, two things at the same time. How do I know if this is really productive or not? And this is why in the myth of multitasking, in my book, I bring two different terms to use. Multitasking itself is confusing and it doesn't accurately represent what is happening. There are really only one of two things that are happening. You are either switch tasking, which we've already established. That's when you're trying to perform multiple attention requiring tasks at the same time, or you are back tasking. Back tasking is where something mindless, mundane, automatic is occurring in the background. So let's use that example running on the treadmill while watching TV. Which of these two activities is occurring in the background? What am I back tasking, right? I, at this point, I sh hopefully shouldn't have to think about how I run. I think most everyone at this point has learned how to walk and run without thinking about it. So the running happens in the background while the TV becomes the focus. Right. Another way that I could do that is, let's say I've got my printer over here, my nice laser printer. I start at printing something while I answer email. That's back tasking. Or even what if I delegate a, a task to my assistant? Boy, we had a huge repetitive task uh, related to my book launch last week, and, and she was kind enough to help me with that. So she took care of that while I was focusing on doing media interviews. Back tasking. That can be productive. That can be efficient. But the problem is most of the time when someone says, Dave, I I'm a good multitasker, they're not talking about backtasking. They're talking about switch tasking. They're talking about juggling multiple attention requiring tasks. And that kind of leads to the second uh, objection. And uh, finish this if you know it. Women can multitask, but men can't, right? This, is, this has been around for a long time. And you know the interesting thing is I, I tried to find the research behind this. And back in 2008, when the book came out, there wasn't even really anything related to this. So I don't even know where the phrase came into existence, but I'm going to cut to the chase. I'm going to get rid of all the controversy, all the argument right now. As someone who has consulted a lot of women executives, including lots of dance studio owners, I can tell you that in my experience, women do incur less switching costs than men do, right? So if something interrupts your attention, it is less costly to you than it is to your average dude, like me. But what? There's a, there's a big but at the end of that sentence. And what is that? But you are still incurring switching costs. And this is true, it doesn't matter what your gender is. It doesn't matter whether you're 60 or you're 16. The problem is whenever you attempt to perform multiple attention requiring tasks, this is not a matter of genetics, it's not a matter of gender, it's a matter of mathematics. You simply cannot avoid some cost. So our goal shouldn't be to try to become a better multitasker. When someone says that they're good at multitasking, what they're saying is that they're incredibly effective at screwing up multiple things at the same time. Our goal instead should be to get better at focusing. If you can focus and get better at doing one thing at a time, you'll incur less switching cost and everything is gonna get a whole lot better. All right, now, 
At this point, some of you are going, oh my gosh, I'm doing things wrong. What should I do? The point of this presentation is not to just make you feel bad about switch tasking. Instead, I want to give you some tools, but first I had to get you on the same page with me as to what it's costing you. And what it's costing you is whatever you wrote down at the beginning of this, right? When I said, what would you do with an extra 40 hours per month? That is what switch tasking is costing you. That thing that you want and you're not getting, that's, you're not getting it because you're switch tasking. We hope you love this sneak peek into our inner circle retreats as much as we did. And if you are ready to take your studio to the next level and join us for these life-changing retreats, make sure to join our inner circle waitlist today at dsoa.com slash inner circle. Before I joined the inner circle, I did absolutely everything for my studio and I did it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I put my family second and my studio first and I realized pretty soon that I was going down a track that I needed to change and that's when I reached out to the inner circle. I had been open for 15 years and I had a lot of students, but it wasn't as profitable as it should have been. And I was doing things wrong, I thought. I had done trial and error on a lot of things and I needed help. And I seen a DSOA ad and joined that and then I was hooked. So my ideal outcome for the studio wasn't that I needed more students or I needed more families in my studio. It was making more smarter and better business decisions within the studio and to get some schooling basically on how to run a studio even though I've been doing it for 15 years at the time. Life after the inner circle is a 360 turnaround for me. Um, I do not work Sundays at all. It's a family day and under no circumstances am I working that day. And um, we, our finances are starting to become in a better place so there's less stress between my husband and I. My studio is organized and running like a smooth ship that doesn't need me half the time. So I've been able to delegate, delegate, delegate and step back and enjoy what I've created. So my revenue within the last year has increased by $51,000. So that is a huge jump. And opening in that, I opened up a third location. So that's including expenses from that. I would recommend the inner circle to either someone who's just starting out because there's so much to learn or someone that has had a studio for 20 years and has done so much work and just might need a little bit of help and get some of that work lifted off of their load. I believe I have about 120 more students, around 100, but for me it wasn't the students because I had a quite large student base. It was bringing additional revenue streams and making the students that I have more profitable and, and making a better studio for them.